Okay, uh, hi everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. Welcome to this policy and practice seminar, which is hosted by the uh, UCL Department of Political Science and School of Public Policy and uh, co badged today with the Policy Lab. Uh, my name is Lucy Barnes. I'm an associate professor in comparative politics at UCL and I'm your chair for today. The title of our seminar today is Who are the markets and what determines their reaction to policy? And I think the impetus for this seminar really came out of the political, economic, and to some extent policy turmoil um, that resulted from the, the Kwarteng Trust mini budget of last year, uh, a, a fiscal event, we've taken to calling it, that triggered a, a relatively kind of unusual, for the UK at least, uh, market response. Um, but the, the, you know, perhaps more usually latent power of the markets that we saw in that episode is a constant, a more constant presence in political rhetoric and in economic reality. Um, as a political scientist, it's hard to kick off this seminar without referring to uh, James Carville, who was one of Bill Clinton's um, staffers, who said that once upon a time he had wanted to be reincarnated and come back as the Pope or the President, but then decided instead he'd much prefer to come back as the bond market because then he could intimidate everybody. Um, but, but as a means for eliciting desired behavior, intimidation is a little bit of a blunt tool. Um, and while market responses do tend to follow some of the tenets of effective psychological conditioning in the sense of swiftly following whatever behavior it is you want to encourage or, or deter. On a couple of other dimensions, they're maybe a little bit less effective. Um, falling short, perhaps, in terms of the consistency of the application of discipline, and falling short also in the absence of the provision of information and instruction uh, as to how to do better next time. And that's really the, the content of our, of our topic today. Um, so, in some ways, the call for consistency might be a bit unfair. Markets aren't just one person who can reliably, uh, you know, uh, act across time, across, across different episodes all the way. Not a single actor. Um, so, some of the question is, who are the individual decision-making entities, whether individual or institutional? Um, and also, whose views and actions make up market sentiment? And then what is it that they value? How do they understand the cause and effect relationships that link government policy to these goals as they understand them and as they seek to pursue them? Um, we have some fantastic speakers uh, to uh, welcome to talk to us on this topic. I'll introduce them in the order in which they're going to speak and also in the order in which they're sitting here. Uh, so we have uh, Sir John Gieve, who after 20 years in uh, Treasury and a stint as a permanent secretary at the Home Office was Deputy Governor for Financial Stability at the Bank of England and a member of the bank's monetary policy um, during the 2007-2009 financial crisis. So first-hand experience there of formulating policy responses in an emergency situation in anticipation of what that reaction from the markets might be. Vicky Price is Chief Economic Advisor at the Centre for Economics and Business Research and a former joint head of the UK Government Economic Service, having previously held senior economic positions in the private sector as well. She's written a number of books, including two which I think touch on our uh, central question today of what it is that capitalist markets find value in and who it is that gets to decide. Um, the most recent one, I'm sure she'll forgive me for plugging, Out Now, How to Be a Successful Economist. Um, and then finally, Dr. Jana Petrescu who is a senior research fellow at the Taubman Center for State and Local Government at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, she's a former finance minister of Romania, so another uh, person with frontline experience of trying to make policy that markets will hopefully not punish uh, too severely. Um, she also has a forthcoming book relevant to our topic today, um, given the different kinds of reactions that different countries experience from markets, um, and that's entitled Adolescent Democracies, a Former Finance Minister's Guide to Policymaking. Um, so I hope you'll agree it's a fantastic lineup. Um, the format for today is that each speaker will offer some opening remarks, about seven minutes. Um, we'll have a little bit of back and forth panel discussion. Uh, I'll try and pick out some questions and themes between the three speakers, and then we'll open the floor for your questions. There will be a roving mic, so once you put your hand up, wait for that to get to you, um, and, then, and then launch into your question once you're mic'd up. 
Um, if the online audience want to ask questions, uh, do write it in the Q&A um, function rather than the chat function. Um, and my colleague Fergus can select uh, from among those questions and, and put them to us in the room. Final note before handing over to our first speaker. This whole session, including the Q&A, is being recorded. Uh, so if you do uh, speak in the Q&A, uh, you will appear on the recording. If you don't speak, you will not appear. Um, the session will be posted online on the department's website and on the YouTube channel and on the podcast after the event. Um, we'll let you know once that recording is available, and if you want to share it with others, please do so. We hope you will. Um, and finally, this uh, event will be followed by a drinks reception back in the Department of Political Science at 36 to 38 Gordon Square. So without further ado, I will hand over to our panelists, and uh, Sir John, if you would like to kick us off. Okay, well, thanks very much, and good evening. Um, I thought I'd... Uh say things under three broad headings. One's about the UK uh, and its history and its context, uh, then a bit about who the markets are that matter to the UK, and then something about the trust quarting fiasco. So, um, first of all, the UK uh, has long had a massive financial industry, a disproportionate share of which has been involved in international finance. It used to be, for a century or more, the financial center of the world. Uh, it's still, I think, in effect, the financial center of EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa in most places. And that has allowed us and got us accustomed to living beyond our means by borrowing from uh, people in other countries. And we've done that more or less consistently over the last 200 years, and certainly all my life. And that's made us vulnerable to losses of market confidence because we've depended on people lending to us. Throughout my life, um, and certainly my career, there have been a series of disasters when um, we've set out on a course of action, the markets have reacted and forced a rapid uh, a retrenchment. Uh, throughout the 50s and 60s, we used to call them balance of payments crises. Uh, then we had the IMF. We had to go to the IMF for a loan because of loss of market confidence in the 1970s. We tried to join the... Um, proto-euro, the ERM, in the early 90s and got forced out of that. Um, in each case, broadly speaking, the governments wanted to expand the economy more rapidly, get some growth by expanding borrowing and spending or cutting taxes, and being forced by market reaction to raise interest rates, cut spending, raise taxes, and bring the economy to a juddering halt. Um, so this latest version under trust and quieting is not at all unusual. It's been the background of the last 70 years at any rate. Um, it was just unusual for being so quick, so brutal, and so stupid. Um, Right, I'll say a bit about the government later on, but who are the markets, which markets are we talking about? The fact is financial services markets are a huge industry, 12.5% of our economy, for example. Uh, they cover a multitude of interlocking uh, organizations, products, and so on. But for governments, the key ones are the foreign exchange market, um, and the gilt market, i.e. government bond markets. So those are the markets which determine the value of your currency, and if it goes down, of course, inflation tends to go up. That's been the story of my life, certainly in Britain. Um, and the government bond market, which is what, how governments borrow to support their own spending, and the key thing there is how much interest they have to pay on that. Uh, in those two markets, those are huge international markets dominated by the world's biggest investment banks and nearly all the big institutional funds that collect your, my, everyone's money are players in one way or another. But they're also um, 
that they also involve a huge number of professionally trained short-term traders. Um, trading in the currencies, trading in the options on the currencies, trading in the options on the options, um, uh, and many of them have borrowed money in order to do that. So there's, a, there's an absolute tumult of, of activity every single day on those two markets. What are they motivated by? Well, what's special about uh, financial markets is that they make money out of dealing, organizing, trading, moving, collecting, dispersing money. Money is their business. So what they care about is making money. And even more important than that is not losing money. And even more important than that, because they do lose money on occasions, is not losing more than the guy next door. So not doing worse than the competition. These people exist in, in a very, very competitive world in which they have to attract other people's money from other professionals. And so it's vital that they don't get caught out and look, uh, you know, they don't want to be an outlier, or at least certainly not an outlier on the downside. This makes it... So when you're talking to markets and what do markets think, you've got to understand the market player doesn't care very much what he thinks. It's not what I think. I'm trying to guess what you all think. I am trying to guess where the weight of money, the herd, is going to move and try and get in a bit ahead of it and make a bit more than the average. So it's, um, so we come to the trust fiasco, one of the lessons of this. So the, the, there are four lessons. The first is the UK needs a lot of foreign capital. It borrows its government borrows a huge amount, has been borrowing a huge amount. Um, it's organized its pension industry so that the pension industry is forced to buy a lot of its debt. But nonetheless, that's not enough. It needs a lot of foreign money. Um, and the economy needs a lot of foreign money because we've run a huge balance of payments deficit for as long as I can remember. Uh, there were brief periods when that's reversed, but Generally, we borrowed massively. We've required foreign capital to finance that. Um, now, one of my uh, previous colleagues, uh, Mark Carney, uh, when governor of the Bank of England, put it that Britain was dependent on the kindness of strangers to support its lifestyle. That's completely wrong. There's nothing about kindness in it at all. We are dependent on the considered calculation of professional traders, sometimes known as gamblers or speculators, on what will make money. So it's not, they're not doing it to be nice to us. The second thing is, they're not doing it because they've got an opinion on whether our policy is a good policy or a bad policy or a futile policy. Um, they're not... Um, uh, it's a mistake to think they're trying to discipline us. They're trying to calculate whether they're going to make money or lose money. If you buy British gilts in pounds and the pound falls, you'll be paid back less than you paid for the gilts. And if you buy a gilt at an interest rate of 2% and then interest rates move to 4 or 5%, the value of that guilt will fall and you will lose money. That's, they're judging all the time. Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? It's a much more sophisticated calculation than that because they're also trying to get a balanced portfolio, so we benefit from that. You know, at least nearly everything goes into dollars or euro, but people like to have a bit of balance, so we benefit from that. But fundamentally, this is a purely financial calculation. Um, second lesson from trust is for trust from trust. If you want to do something unconventional, and in particular if you want to borrow a lot of money, extra money, it's absolutely essential to reassure the people you're going to borrow it from that you've got a plan that they can, you know, that's going to work or has a good chance of working. 
a good chance they'll get their money back and uh, they'll make some, 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 some income from it. And we have developed in the Treasury over many years a huge array of ways of reassuring markets. We have independent forecasts. We have rules about how much borrowing we're going to do and how, how, how we're going to bring it back. We have um, fiscal strategies, medium-term financial strategies. We, have, we try to get helpful commentaries from trusted third parties, if possible, the IMF and the OECD, to say this looks like a sensible policy. Um, the crass stupidity of the trust quarting interlude was that they didn't do any of that. They, 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 they didn't, they, they cancelled the independent forecasts, they, they sacked the permanent secretary of the treasury, they, 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 they boasted about how unconventional they were going to be and how they weren't going to accept the boring constraints of treasury orthodoxy. I can tell you there isn't much treasury orthodoxy. I was there for 20 years. The only bit of orthodoxy I can remember is you've got to be careful about borrowing in case the people you're borrowing from lose, lose confidence. Um, third lesson, um, which is sort of spoils the story on trust a little bit, but when Hemingway was asked how he went bankrupt, he said, gradually, then suddenly. And uh, that's how financial crises happen, too. So for two years, up until the beginning of 2022, gilt yields, that's the interest rate we had to pay on gilts, were around 1%, sometimes a bit below. Then they started to edge up as the pandemic came to an end across the world, but in, in Britain too. And they got to sort of 2.5% by June, and then they edged up a little bit more to 3% at the beginning of September. And then in five days, they went up to 5%. And, um, uh, and of course, at that point, people who'd been planning on 25 to 3 maybe edging up to 35 uh, were caught out. A lot of banks stopped stopped advancing mortgages, et cetera, et cetera. The pound fell through the floor. The, the, the budget was withdrawn. The government was sacked. Um, uh, we retrenched. That's where we are today. Um, and the last point, just a particular point about Britain um, in this case, is that the complexity and the interlocking of different financial markets sometimes exacerbates the problem. And that happened in a big way last autumn because pension funds, British pension funds, which are actually very stodgy investors, slow moving, they don't do much trading, they're conservative, they are locked into buying gilts uh, to a large extent, actually had, had dabbled in a new thing called liability-driven investment, which uh, is, it wasn't that at all. It's a, it's a form of borrowing to try and up their income. And in that little bit, they got, they got caught out by a sudden change in gilt prices. So they started selling gilts, and they have a lot of gilts. So that drove the gilt price down, the gilt yields up, and you got a self-supporting spiral. So um, no one saw that coming, incidentally, although a few people have claimed to do so since. But um, so those are my, my four lessons from the trust episode, and that's enough from me. Thank you. Uh, Vicky? Well, um, I have to say that I agree uh, very much with what um, John has just said. The interesting thing is I started my life in a bank and I was uh, right next to a foreign exchange dealers. And I, uh, I think the, the sort of, uh, principle of them trying to make as much money as possible for the bank, of course, but also outdo everyone else. And there is an issue that uh, market participants, for some reason, the traders, all think they're going to outdo the market somehow. But someone's going to lose in all this. Uh, so there are winners and losers, but they start off without necessarily expecting that to happen. Um, but I'll start with the trust issue, but because uh, it's absolutely true that what markets want is uh, information. So in the States, of course, there are the Fed watchers, have been Fed watchers for a long period of time. So they, they, they listen to every single word that any of the governors have 
have uh, uttered to try and understand how interest rates might move. And of course, that gives some warning to um, all the other interest rates in the market. And um, it's a huge, huge business. We are only just starting doing that in the UK. Of course, everyone is, is uh, following what the various MPC members are saying. But the interesting thing about the UK is that they all say something very different. It's, it happens occasionally in the US as well. But, uh, we hear those pronouncements and the market is just trying to understand what um, is actually meant. And we've seen, like today, um, there are dissenting voices in the Monetary Policy Committee. So uh, deciding where things might go uh, can sometimes be difficult, but the market has already priced in a 50 um, uh, basis points increase and they acted accordingly. So they can um, foresee, if you like, quite a lot of what's there from uh, you know, looking very, very carefully now at what um, uh, the pronouncements are. But of course, remember, there was a time when there was no independent uh, MPC and where interest rate decisions were decided between the governor of the Bank of England and the chancellor. Uh, I'd like to think that we have moved a long, long way uh, from that, even though every now and then uh, there is an, uh, an attempt to exercise a bit of influence. And we had that actually during the trust period as well. Now, uh, I mentioned the Bank of England for a reason, uh, and that is that uh, you would assume, uh, mainly because of course there is a, uh, the Treasury Chief Economist sits or attends the MPC meetings, um, that there is some sort of um, discussion between, uh, as there is, between the Bank of England and the Treasury, and that there is some knowledge before any interest rate decision of what's going to come next, and yet, I'm afraid in this particular case of the trust event, the mini-budget, the day before the, the mini-budget itself, I mean, we knew that trust intended to cut taxes. We knew that the emphasis was on growth. We knew they did not intend to talk to the OBR, or at least not for that mini-budget. They would have done so a little bit later. Um, we knew already that they were going to borrow huge amounts of money for um, the electricity price cap which they're going to be putting in place, which is going to last for two years. So that was quite huge. The markets knew of this. The Bank of England knew of this. The markets were quite happy with that until then. Admittedly, it was all a bit interrupted by the Queen's death. And maybe the markets forgot uh, temporarily. And this is what Liz Truss was all about. After all, she was then elected uh, by the members as uh, the head of the party and then became prime minister. But that was her intention. So it wasn't new. And yet, the Bank of England announced, and the, uh, the Bank of England knowing how much borrowing there would come as a result of that, huge, they announced on that uh, previous day, so it was Thursday, and the Bank of England announcement came like it did today. The following day, we had the mini budget. They announced that actually they were happier with the inflation um, profile of the UK. So they were going to increase interest rates, even though originally, uh, we thought they might go for a 75 uh, uh, basis points increase. They would increase them by just 50 basis points, and they would start quantitative tightening. And they would sell something like 70 billion worth of bonds during uh, the next the, that financial year and continue to do so over a period. So every year they would have flowed their 895 billion um, uh, pounds worth of gilts that they had on their portfolio, mainly because, of course, they did huge amount of quantitative easing, like all the other central banks, and they were going to just start, like the following Monday, uh, to sell those gilts back to the market, so that we'd have a move from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. Well, you then had the following morning the announcement of the mini-budget, which was not surprising. It's true they didn't have all the background information that John uh, talked about, but it wasn't any surprise to anyone. But the market then, if they, when, once they put together the Bank of England's intention to offload loads and loads of gilts, and what Liz Truss was intending to do, got indigestion. So what the market generally likes to know is that the institutions of government talk to each other, or at least that there is some sort of um, uh, not coincidence in what they do, if you like, but, but, but there is some clarity and some continuity in what happens. So you don't suddenly have one bit of government doing one thing and another one doing something which will make what the first bit of government, very important one, which is the Treasury, 
wants to, to do, they're completely impossible to achieve. So that's one rule, and we seem to have completely forgotten. So I think the bank has something to answer uh, in that area. But since I've talked about the banks, I should also talk about the European Central Bank, uh, which has done similar things at various times, because it hasn't given quite the right information. But during the financial crisis, before I, I, I touch on the ECB, I was working uh, for the government at the time, and we had something called the National uh, Economic Council, and there was an officials group underneath, and I was attending those meetings you know, almost you know, twice a week. And of course, we had all these problems what to do with the financial sector. Again, the markets were waiting. Uh, there was a lot of instability. We had to do something about calming the markets, and a lot of money was put into the system. Uh, we didn't quite know what to do. We had Northern Rock, of course, uh, already. Uh, what do you do about saving some of the banks or not, as the case may be? But we still had the Bank of England over there, and apologies for that, uh, John, uh, with uh, the governor, Mervyn King, who was a great economist, going around talking about moral hazard. So basically telling the markets, we're not going to save any of the banks, because if we save one, we have to save others. So. I have to, I mean, it's some time now since I was there. Um, so we used to say, oh, well, please make sure he doesn't say anything today. And yet, you know, he'd go abroad, he'd still make a speech about moral hazard, and we knew we were doomed uh, because the markets listen to this and think, well, the banks are going to collapse. In the end, of course, what did one have to do? Support all the banks. Buy up, if you like, nationalize the Royal Bank of Scotland. Support mo most of the banking system all across the world. We let almost no bank really go bankrupt. And once they were in trouble, we uh, helped them uh, uh, consolidate, if you like, with others. So what one bit of government, again, says matters hugely if you are trying to stabilize the economy through different means. Uh, and I think that's a lesson of how the markets, you know, you want them to operate the right way, and you don't want them to completely destabilize your economy, then you need to give them the right information. So, the ECB and what happened during the financial crisis in, uh, in Europe. Because obviously, you know, we had austerity here, but Europe had the Eurozone crisis. Uh, for those of you who can detect accents or who know me, we know that I'm Greek-born. And of course, we had a particular um, view of what happened uh, in the years that followed the financial crisis. And with Greece, of course, ending up with its GDP falling by something like 28% over a, a number of years. So, huge. Now, we're worrying right now about a fall of 0.5% in GDP, which the Bank of England forecast for the UK. Well, I mean, imagine surviving a 25-28% uh, fall in GDP. Now, how, wh why did all this happen, and, and, and how did the various markets react? I mean, the truth is that during the whole of the period of the Eurozone crisis, you had uh, moments of serious, serious concern that the whole thing was going to collapse. And I'm not just talking about the euro, I'm talking also about the banking system. Uh, and, of course, there was a huge amount of quantitative easing that was done by various um, bodies, like the, uh, the Bank of England, not really by the European Central Bank until 2015. Uh, and in terms of Greece and uh, the announcement of Merkel and Sarkozy at the end of 20 or sometime in 2011, that they weren't really going to, uh, that they were not going to do anything to bail out Greece in any sort of way that involved all the other uh, states together, and that Greece was by itself, of course, meant that suddenly Greece could not borrow at all in the capital markets. The capital markets react to all those and, uh, pronouncements. Um, and of course, not supporting Greece also meant one can really support other countries with high debt, such as Italy and Spain and Ireland, which all got into great difficulties after that. Uh, so what had to happen then? Someone had to do something about this. So the, 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 the voice changed. Draghi, who came after Trisha, had to say in 2012 that he would do everything to save the euro. That was interpreted by the markets as meaning that there was going to be QE finally in Europe as well. QE didn't come for three years after that because the Germans objected, but the markets believed that it would happen. Everything stabilized. Of course, we had various periods after that when this was a bit of a problem. Uh, but that's basically what, what was going on. So, so the, the markets were watching that very carefully and every now and then punishing the countries if those statements were inconsistent with what actually made a lot of sense logically. And then that would force the, the various institutions to react and do the right thing. 
So this circular sort of way of working is actually rather useful, and thank God for the markets, which, which ended up sort of giving you some reasonable policy uh, for the Eurozone. But we had this, just the last point that I would make, very recently as well, because we've had a, a huge period of QE, uh, quantitative easing, now everywhere, because the, the, the European Central Bank, once they started doing it, uh, they went uh, for it in a very big way as to be done in, in, in a number of other countries. Um, now, of course, we've come to a point where, you know, you've sort of recovered from the financial crisis. Uh, the, the Europe, which had negative growth for a while in the mid-2010s, uh, uh, has sort of recovered, even though some countries are still way below where they were at the beginning of the financial crisis, including Italy, per capita, and also, of course, Greece. Um, and uh, they then, even though, in, loads of countries are very heavily indebted, more indebted than would have been the case otherwise, because, of course, we also had the energy crisis. We had COVID and then the energy crisis. Now, the, 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 the ECB has announced that it's going to stop QE itself. Uh, the US has already stopped it, doing quantitative tightening. So they announced this summer, just to explain how announcements matter, is the last point, um, that they were going to stop QE. They were going to be quite careful, though, because they were still going to be buying uh, re um, reinvesting all the bonds that matured, and they were going to be quite careful about how they eased out of this, a lot more careful than the Bank of England or the, uh, or the US Fed, and they were going to do that over a period. Uh, but that QE was going to stop anyway. Well, the markets, if you remember, in the summer, just went slightly berserk, because they thought that meant that all those countries, like Greece, Italy, and others who were heavily indebted, were going to be left to themselves, even though you know, QE had helped hugely buying all their bonds uh, and being able to continue to borrow at reasonably uh, low rates. So it took, I think, if I remember, one afternoon of rethinking the policy before they, the, uh, the Europeans announced this new thing, which is called the Transmission Protection Instrument. It just came out like that. So Lagarde said one thing one moment. Uh, Philip Lane, her chief economist, obviously, or perhaps it isn't quite like that, it's all recorded. I've no idea who actually thought about this. Um, must have said, well, we need to worry a little bit about what will happen if suddenly all this spreads, sort of widen, and now we find, once again, that Greece, Italy, Spain are in default territory, which would be terrible for the euro and terrible for the world economy, and they invented this thing, the transmission protection instrument, which basically says that if it looks like the spreads are widening too much between the various uh, countries' debt, then we'll intervene again and do more QE. Well, we're back to square one, really, but it is another example of how policy sometimes is made on the hoof, if you like, because the capital markets force you to do so. Okay? Thank you. And uh, finally, Joanna, go Thank ahead. you. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, in light of what uh, John and Vicky said, I think uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to wear three different hats, and I'm going to try to to reinterpret what John and Vicky very nicely explained about what happened in uh, in UK and, and in Europe. So first, it's going to be sound a little bit weird, but I'm going to put like my head of a horse person. So anyone who dealt with horses know that every individual horse has a particular personality, right? Some of them are a bit more courageous. Some of them are a bit more skittish. Some of them are, are very friendly. So that's, that's their personality. But then when you put them together, and it's a herd, because I, I heard you actually use that word. So that's the image of horses immediately got into my head, John, and um, it's uh, they act very differently all of a sudden. Uh, you know, they get scared much, uh, much quicker. Uh, they, uh, they, they follow the, the leader. They have a, a horse who is the leader in that particular herd, right? So they act very differently than their own personality in a herd. And so I want you to have that image in your head when, when we're discussing about markets. But I want, I want you, as you're keeping this image of a herd of horses who gets easily scared and run amok, to know that, that horse people know this. So they're careful when there are multiple horses of what they do around them. And actually, policymakers also know this about markets. They know that they're irrational. There are like tons and tons of papers written about this. And now I'm going to put my econ academic economist hat. So if you look in the Journal of Finance on the number of papers on market irrationality, there will be a ton of them. So it's not something that it should have been surprising anyone. 
So, so we know that, the, that, that they act on emotion, they act on what the media is saying. They're, these are documented things. Um, we also know from academic literature, from serious academic literature, that they also don't like instability. They act negatively to instability. Okay, so, so, so let's put these things together. So, um, so they act like a herd, uh, they don't like instability, they act emotionally. Um, we know that the, the, the moment when this mini-budget happened, it was not a random moment in the history of UK. There was a little bit of instability that's quite unusual for, for, an, uh, for a full democracy like UK. In Romania, it's actually kind of normal to, to change prime ministers quite often and finance ministers. This is not normal for an established democracy. So already you were in a very difficult situation with the markets. They're already skittish. And, and there already, already there is a lot of instability. So from what I am hearing from what uh, Vicky and John probably know much more about what, what's going on with the, um, with the mini budget. Uh, so these things uh, uh, um, jump at me that seems like they, they really check the trifecta. Uh, from, uh, now I'm putting my politician <coughs> policymaker hat. Uh, so you said that they fired the, or, uh, the, the permanent secretary. On, <laughs> yeah, so um, if you want to do that, to fire your permanent secretary, so that's like the chief bureaucrat in your Ministry of Finance, a few weeks before the budget, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a very risky move to do. So you might want, or not, to do that, but definitely not the weeks before, uh, before the budget. And that, um, so not only that would scare a little bit the markets, but um, that's the person who has institutional knowledge in the Minister of Finance, in the Treasury, in the case of UK. But that's the same in Romania and everywhere. Um, that institutional knowledge of what works and what doesn't, it's very important when you're doing a budget. Um, they also are probably the one who do part of this communication. Not all of the communication is done by the, by the Prime Minister or by the Finance Minister. There are other types of discussions with other bureaucrats, with other institutions, with other, uh, other stakeholders that these top bureaucrats are, are usually people uh, that are being trusted because they're there for a long period of time. They're I politically usually uh, uh, there. And, and, and again, that institutional knowledge, which is very important. Um, so, so that's something that flags the politician in me that, that that's, that's one very, uh, very risky thing to do. There is another risk to this. Um, and that, again, my politician had here you fire someone really early on, because then this, then the, they were just coming or something, um, then uh, other bureaucrats in your ministry will not dare to tell you you're wrong. Well, I can assure you. <laughs> if your first move is like to fire the top bureaucrat, no one is going to tell you, like, oh, this budget might not go well with the market. So, so I mean, in my experience, that's the case. Uh, and and, and the, the, the British um, uh, policymaker at the table, maybe they have another idea. But, but that's, that's my take. Second. Um, Office of Budget Responsibility. Unlike Romania, um, UK has better institutions. Um, in Romania, we, we also have such an office that sits under the Ministry of Finance, which makes it less, uh, uh, less independent, let's put it that way. The fact that, that UK has better institutions and, 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 um, and such an office that is independent, it's a plus and it adds credibility to anything that the, the Treasury does. Because if you have the, this office that is independent that says, look, this is a correct forecast, this makes sense, we calculated, these people are not crazy, that, that gives extra confidence in the market because someone else you know, said that, that you didn't go astray with whatever you were proposing. So that's second. right? The third one is, uh, and this one even I heard from, from abroad, were um, sort of the, the, the mini fight between the, the Treasury and, and the central bank during that period, that was, that, that was in the media, that was public, that was not like some private discussion. Um, that's, that's, an, that's a third thing that, that sort of make maybe that herd of in the market a little bit skittish because you have now also a new uh, Treasury, uh, new person in the Treasury that uh, and a new prime minister that doesn't get along with the central bank. I want to emphasize as an economist that I truly believe that the central bank should be independent, that fiscal policy should be absolutely independent from monetary policy. That being said, 
always, even in a country that is not such an established democracy like UK, there are discussions between the Ministry of Finance and, and, uh, and the central bank, right? You, you don't go publicly, you don't necessarily argue, but, but you say, look, I probably propose this budget, but do you think you can take in consideration or not? But there are these discussions going on and, and it's healthy to have these discussions. So the fact that they were publicly fighting signals again to this market that, you know, something is wrong. So that's what I'm saying is the trifecta because I have seen in other cases, especially in Romania, where some politicians maybe did one of the three or maybe two of the three, but three out of three, <laughs> I haven't seen. So, um, so, so then I'm not like really surprised to some extent of what happened because take the, the, the herd of the market, add the instability that was pre-existing, and add the three things that they were very clearly and visibly doing that eroded the, the confidence in the market that they're doing the right things and they're using the established institutions of, of UK in order to, uh, to have a, a budget that, that it's sustainable, that, that makes sense, and then you get what you get. So, um, so that's, that's sort of my, my three hats, just by adding uh, to, uh, uh, to the very, very interesting presentations before. I don't think I can add much more on the British side, except for what I learned here. I, I wouldn't dare, but I'm sure that we can have more questions. Uh, thank you, all three. I, that was a really uh, fascinating and wide-ranging set of remarks, which I mainly was just kind of making notes to take away and study at, in great academic depth later. Um, but I, I, I want to kind of pick up on, I think, across all three of you to give an answer to the question that this seminar, the questions that this seminar was was framed around, and then ask for a quick-fire reaction. So. Who are the markets? Highly trained quantitative professionals who are somehow nevertheless terrified of being a bit worse than their friend. Um, and what determines their reaction to policy? They don't react to policy in itself, is, is kind of what I'm hearing, both in terms of it's not a punishment from Sir John and in terms of some of the comments uh, from, from Vicky as well. But rather what they react to is the signals that policies may send about the quality of governance, about communication between important institutions, about the, the functioning of those institutions pulling in the same direction as one another. Um, and because that's what provides assurances that that money, which is their, their fundamental bottom line, will kind of um, remain safe and be, have this stable foundation through the future, that that's not necessarily vulnerable to policy change, but it might be vulnerable to uh, institutional conflict or um, or, in, or institutional instability or, or wrongheadedness. Um, have I got it completely wrong? No, I think it's, uh, um, a lot of that I'd agree with. Um, who are the markets? Well, they are um, professionals. I mean, you know, you go into any investment bank, any big trader that, that well, this used to be the case, maybe they're all at home now, where there used to be serried ranks of desks, guys with, with, with screens. Um, the guy next door may, may be your friend, but probably not. He's your competitor. I mean, basically, you're, you, all of these guys, or many of them, are um, incentivized by highly geared bonus systems to do better than the average. Uh, of course, People, not everyone can do better than the average, so some people lose out. That's the world they're living in. So it's, it's competitive in that way. I, I think that trusts sort of and Quartin sort of believe that because they were doing something very sort of right wing, you know, they were cutting taxes on the rich, they were, um, they were abolishing bonus caps, they were going to let markets rip that they thought the people in the markets would think, whoa, this is, this is what we like. That was, I mean, which they may well, obviously, a lot of them benefited from, from, from or would have benefited from the tax cuts. Um, uh, they mainly got round the bonus caps anyway, so, uh, but, uh, but the tax cuts would have benefited them individually. But that isn't, that was a sort of misunderstanding um, as to what the markets are looking for. They're looking, look, take Greece. 
Greece overborrowed on a totally unsustainable basis and an implicit uh, guarantee support from the European Union and the other members of the Euro area. And um, what happened uh, in 2010 was that, well, a number of things happened. Firstly, you had a very radical government in Greece which said it was going to be very unorthodox and so on, so there were elements of that. But secondly, people started to question whether or not there really was a guarantee and noticed that Greece certainly couldn't support its own economy and that level of borrowing on its own. And it, now, so people started to raise the price of lending to Greece or just stopped lending to Greece because they thought they might lose their money if actually there wasn't a guarantee. The decision, if you like, to punish Greece wasn't the market punishing Greece. The, the decision that mattered was the rest of the euro area saying, no, there isn't a guarantee and we won't support you until actually things got to such a bad case that they said, oh, on second thoughts, we will, and, and, and it unwound. But it's a mistake. I think it is a mistake to see the markets are sort of sitting there saying, oh, we don't like these policies. These policies will be bad for capitalism, so we'll punish you. What they're calculating is, in our case, on trust and quarting, Britain's detached itself from its main trading bloc. It is independent. It's borrowed a lot of money. It's now got a government which says it's going to borrow a hell of a lot more and it doesn't much care uh, what the Treasury or anyone else says about it. It's thinking that they could turn into Greece or something like Greece. We could lose a lot of money on this. That's what's driving them. Uh, in fact, the papers were saying we're turning to Italy, if I remember. Well, I mean, Italy is on the, the road to Greece. Uh, oh, well, that, yes. And Romania are very close, of course, as well. <laughs> so just to, to get our geography France right. Yeah, yes. No, but France, yeah, a long way right. up the... Um, I, I have to say I have a slightly different view of, of, of what happens, uh, the signals given to the market at the time. So if we just talked about, uh, about Greece. At the time, France, Sarkozy was in favour of giving general support because the worries about everybody else in the Eurozone. Uh, Trichet, who was the governor of the European Central Bank, was shocked when Merkel uh, made, the made the announcement that there wasn't going to be uh, support given generally to, um, to Greece because of what it would mean for all the other countries. And of course we had a huge problem with the other countries. And then they finally decided after a while that of course you know, the, through QE all these bonds would be bought and everything would be fine. And in fact Greece right now is the fastest growing economy in Europe, but of course from a low base. Um, but it is really the, the message given to the markets that I was trying to make. Whether Greece had over-borrowed is a different issue, but so had lots of other countries. But the messages given were A, a little bit confusing, and B, at the end, influenced hugely the, the trajectory, if you like, for those countries. So it matters a lot. That was really the, the point I was making. And, and in this particular case, the ECB and the politicians, if you like, didn't agree. And different messages were coming to the market at various stages about what, in fact, was going to happen. It was really the point that I was also making about uh, what happened between the Bank of England and the Treasury. But in terms of the markets, if I go back to that, of course, everyone wants to be making money. But it is a little bit wider. I mean, what mattered in Europe a lot was what the rating agencies thought. The UK, which could print its own money, didn't really have the same problem. But we had constructed a euro area with the institutions being there which really weren't supporting the individual members. Those institutions have now been rethought. And to a considerable extent, it is the way that the markets reacted to there not being that support which has led to this improvement in the institutional structure of the euro. So they've actually been incredibly useful from that uh, point of view because they have forced, it is obvious now that should there be any departure, that's why I mentioned what happened last summer when it was the first time the ECB raised its interest rates but also it was the time when it announced these new measures and what it was going to do with QE. It didn't dare after, you know, it almost dared, you know, say everyone to themselves and then had to retract very, very fast because you knew what the markets were going to do in terms of punishing them. And that type of message needs to be constantly reinforced and 
every now and then, of course, there is a bit of a slippage, and then they remember that they've got to keep them on board. So, so they're very important. So going back to your original question, um, what you tell them is important, but also the policies. It isn't just, you know, because they have to trust you up to a point. Sometimes they don't trust you, and they do completely the opposite, and they make you do the opposite, because they don't think it's sustainable, like when we were in the ERM. I mean, the markets, funnily enough, towards the end, even though we were raising interest rates, decided actually we were going to leave pretty soon, so the, mar so the economy would do reasonably well. So stock, stock markets changed and, and actually did rather well. So, so you can't, they are becoming very important, huge amounts of money floating about. And of course, in the case of the UK, um, because we're quite, you know, there's a, we're still in a globalized environment, whatever we may think following all these shocks we've had, uh, money can move around very easily, and you compare yourself not just in terms of what you do with your next-door neighbor sitting at your desk, but also can you make a lot more money investing somewhere else? And that has to be followed constantly by the policymakers here, or anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so let me let me add uh, something to what uh, what Vicky was saying, I think. And um, so in in a lot of countries where you know stock markets are not that developed, um, so. Um, thinking just of the financial markets maybe is not necessarily the, the best model. Of course, um, even in countries like Romania, it's clearly very important to keep the, the, the people who actually give you the money <laughs> to finance your, your debt uh, happy, right? So you have foreign investors and, 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 and you borrow, so obviously you can't do two crazy things because then they're not going to trust you that you are able to repay your debt and, and, and then you're going to, to finance that debt with very high interest rates and, and you don't want to do that, right? So it's not that it's irrelevant, not, not even close. But um, uh, I wouldn't know if I would call them markets, but I would say that there are other, let's say, important stakeholders that um, are affected by these economic policies and they react maybe uh, uh, to these economic policies that, that policymakers in, other, in, in these countries have to pay careful attention to. So, so I said um, sort of these, uh, these foreign investors that, that finance your, your debt and because you're borrowing, um, then you have stakeholders like IMF, for example, that um, you know, maybe they're also giving you a loan, in which case uh, they also have certain conditions, so you can't spook them out with some crazy uh, budget uh, that, that they wouldn't like because then they, you, you don't get the next uh, uh, amount of money. Uh, then you have European um, Union, if you're part of the European Union because if, uh, if there, there are rules about, there used to be rules about deficits and budgets and obviously if you break them you risk certain sanctions. So that's another, it's not a market but it's a stakeholder that you need to be careful when you're you, uh, you are doing these uh, policies that they are being formed, that, that, that are being consulted, that they are comfortable and they don't get scared by these economic policies that, that you are proposing. Um, the, um, the rating agencies that, that you mentioned earlier, obviously that's extremely important and I would say that for a country like Romania that is just like above the, <laughs> the junk rating, uh, you want to be super, super careful. It's much easier when you're like much higher. Uh, much higher up, so those people need to not uh, uh, be uh, be scared by whatever policies you are proposing. So they're not markets, but they're very important stakeholders that can, cannot be let be um, uh, scared after a budget or after an economic policy. Thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll turn to questions. Just it seems that these, these markets are less like the intimidating bully of James Carville and much more like the skittish horses, so you just have to whisper them gently um, at all times. Um, Pascal's going to bring the mic around. Um, if you have a question, pop your hand up. I'll see just how many hands spring up immediately and see if we need to take them in a, in a, in a batch or if we can go one at a time. So if anyone does have a question, we have... Uh, Alan here in the front, the gentleman in the navy jacket a couple rows back. Let's take you two as a starting round and then we'll come, come again. Um, this has been brilliant, thank you so much. Um, there seems to be a never-ending debate about whether austerity was necessary in the UK after 2010. So what do you think? And um, supposing we get a Labour government at some point in the next two years, if it wanted to borrow more, would it have room to do so? Uh, in the middle, yeah, there you go. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Brilliant uh, presentation and conversation. Sonia Ujage, Canary Wolf Entrepreneur. So you, you've talked about um, money. You've talked about the past a lot. But I would like to think about the future and talk about what's happening currently. So I am personally not so much worried about the money or the economy. But what I'm worried about is the currency. So maybe when we step outside the UK and Europe, at the moment, there's a serious divide in the world. And there's a serious trust crisis in the world. So literally, if you take the United States of America, you take the UK, you take Europe, you take those countries out. Once you go around the world, people are asking themselves one question. What is the global trading, trade currency we should trust in at the moment? And also, bear in mind that those countries that I've mentioned, UK, Europe, and continent Europe, and US, they don't have the commodities and the natural resources that are necessary for their industry and their economy. So the rest of the world that has in abundance natural resources, they are now wondering, what currency should we use? Dollars to sell our commodities. So I'm pretty much worried about this new world that we're heading towards. So I would like to know your take on this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for those great questions. Um, I'll ask you to maybe pick one priority among the, the three questions. Was austerity necessary? Could labor borrow more? And what is and what should be the global trading currency? Um, and let's come back in the reverse order so we give you Anna the chance to kick off. Okay. Um, so um, I think all of them are very, very important questions. Um, I don't think I have an answer for all of them. But in terms of um, borrowing and increasing debt, I think we're going to see more and more. I don't want to speak for UK in general, but I think it used to be, um, I think the framework of mine changed during COVID. Um, it, I mean, the framework in general was that you're supposed to attempt to reduce the deficit and, and to keep the, the debt under control. And that simply disappeared. Um, and I'm not saying it's a good thing, it's just it happened. And, and now we see more and more country uh, doing that. This, um, and, 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 and it's very, very, very difficult once you open the door to that mentality to close it back. It's good to have a doorstop somewhere. And when you don't have that doorstop, when we're talking about deficits and debts, uh, it, you swing the door open till, till it hits the wall. And I think that's what happens. I think the time of reckoning at some point will come, uh, but not necessarily really soon. I think we'll, we'll continue to, um, to, to see that. Um, and um, to answer your question about austerity, um, I wouldn't like to necessarily answer for UK per se, because maybe I don't know enough about the situation. But I, in general, I'm not a big fan of that. Um, so, so I would say that, that there are always other ways in which you, you can uh, achieve that. Maybe it, it seems like it's in contradiction to what I was saying, but it's not. I mean, I think you can, you can certainly keep a, a, a deficit under control and, and, and debt under control without going to the, the extreme of the austerity. So I think I'm going to leave it to that. I will not even attempt to say which currency should be my. I'm going to pass that on to, um, to Vicky and, and, and John. I think that's a, that's a very complicated question to answer. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, it's, it's like, yeah. I'm, well, um, you said to pick, but. Um, but to answer very quickly, I think austerity was a big mistake. Uh, it has led to us having very low growth in the longer term. So it might have satisfied various needs that perhaps we had at the time to just appear not to be like Greece, which is, I think, what, what the politicians of the coalition were saying at the time. Uh, but in fact, it has caused long-term damage in terms of investment and, and productivity growth. So not good news. Can you borrow more? Well, you have to have, as we've been discussing, a proper policy uh, that uh, the markets can believe, and you can borrow more. Um, indeed, uh, you can, but of course, if you have faster growth, I think that was what this trust was hoping, then you can borrow more. So we're going back to, to that. Well, 
because you've got to do a lot of work to achieve that faster growth. And it's not just with borrowing that you do it, you do all sorts of, all sorts of other things that you absolutely need to do uh, to get that growth to happen, productivity to improve. Uh, in terms of currency, I mean, you need to, to obviously use a currency that you have faith in and one where, um, where there is a lot of, of that money around, if you like, that can be used for trading purposes. Um, uh, the problem, of course, is because it's used so extensively, that's the dollar. Uh, whenever the dollar goes up and everyone has borrowed in dollars, um, then that is a serious problem for all the indebted countries, and that's, that's an issue. And the payment systems, of course, are moving now away from, possibly, for some parts of the world, mainly because of the war in Ukraine and the changes in the geopolitical uh, relationships that exist, to one where perhaps there are payment systems now created that work between, you know, which, which are also pushed and work between sort of Russia and all its satellites, if you like, countries, uh, China and other countries that it's the involved. BRICS. Hmm? The BRICS. The BRICS, possibly, but I don't think all the BRICS, but certainly a certain number of them. So you're thinking about Brazil as well, which is part of it, which isn't perhaps uh, part of that new payment system. And India, of course, which is... Uh, so there is already a movement to do that, but it, it's, it, it may start to work. And of course, if we do indeed become increasingly separated, politically as well, um, and also possibly in trade, although I think at the end of the day this will all be fine again. But I mean, right now we have the World Trade Organization saying there's only going to be 1% trade growth in, in 2023. That's appalling. Uh, and the EU, though, is really trying to ensure that the euro becomes more of a, of a, um, uh, of a currency used for, for reserves and also for trade, um, which I think is actually important for itself. Um, so, so we don't know how we, it's all going to end up, but the, the over-dominance of the dollar obviously has all sorts of problems with it, and I think you're quite right. Um, yeah, well, the dollar's still the only game in town in the currencies. You know, Bitcoin, you know, uh, the last year has shown <laughs> that's not going to work. The ruble, I mean, who's going to trade in the ruble? The renminbi, absolutely, if you're dependent on China, they'll make you trade in that. But it's not an open, it's not an open traded currency. It's politically controlled, you know. Uh, uh, the dollar will be the dominant currency uh, till I die anyway. Actually, that may not be very long. But, you know, <laughs> even beyond that, uh, till you die, probably, um, rather than me. Um, so a long time ahead. Uh, in terms of austerity... Um, they may have overdone the austerity. There's also a question of how they did austerity. You know, they chose to cut public spending quite brutally in some ways um, because they did want to, they did want to raise taxes. They could perfectly well have had the same borrowing at a higher level of welfare spending and higher taxation. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely don't buy the argument that it was all unnecessary. Um, I, um, you know, that's what we've just learned again in a very brutal and obvious way is that there are limits to how, how much you can borrow. You've got to have a plan that stacks up. People have got to believe that if they lend you the money, they'll get it back with interest. And if they don't, you know, and that doesn't mean it's got to be under 100% of GDP. Or there's, no, there's no sort of mechanical limit. You know, the Japanese are at 250% or whatever it is um, because the Japanese buy their own debt. So that's a sort of closed economy. And but, but nonetheless, they've got something that's credible to the Japanese investor. Um, and... I feel that getting a grip, which is essentially what, what, what that austerity period is about, was, was probably necessary and still is today and was in a lot of Europe too. Um, if you look at the most successful European economy, which is a German economy in my lifetime, they have been the most orthodox in economic policy. They haven't believed in borrowing. They haven't believed in um, and, and repeatedly what they've done is to change the supply side of the economy to stay competitive at whatever rate of exchange and so on they've been, they've been given. And that has proved, over the 70 years, much the most successful policy. Um, there was something else. Oh, Labour, will it be able to... Yeah, of course, Labour will be able to borrow more, uh, a bit more. 
Um, I mean, we'll come, I hope, we'll come out of the next two years with a sort of stabilised, you know, I mean, trusts capsized the boat. We got it upright now, but it's full of water. But I'm hoping that, you know, it's going nowhere. It's just sort of, but it, it is at least upright. Um, uh, I'm hoping that over the next two years it will get going again. It will be in reasonable order. And if they come in with a w cogent, well-argued, limited program of green investment and so on and so forth, I'm sure they'll be able to raise the money for that. And, uh, and that's what I expect to happen. Great. I think we have time for just a quick round uh, of further questions. The red lanyard in, on the left was one, and we have another in the back in the green rugby shirt. Possibly space for one more if anyone else wants to round out the show. Oh, hi. So this is just for the women on the right, uh, the women in the room. Salut. I just wanted to ask, uh, if I'm not wrong, you were the foreign, well, you were the uh, finance uh, minister of finance, if I'm not wrong. I just wanted to ask, what did your job involve and what impact on Romania did you leave? And why did you leave your job eventually? <laughs> <laughs> if that's the right to ask, of course. Okay. Um, so, as finance minister in Romania, because that, that's, that's a very legitimate question because the portfolio might uh, contain different things depending on, on the country. So, um, not only that you were in charge of setting up the budget and setting up the expenditures and, and the revenue part, um, so what does that mean? That means also the tax administration is under you because you have to collect the taxes. Right, but it's also the part that that spends that sets up the expenditures, right? Um, so that's sort of like the the sort of math part of it. But the Ministry of Finance is also the the institution that uh, that would issue legislation in terms of regulation of banks and things like that. Obviously, in collaboration with the central bank, because the central bank cannot actually do that. Um, it also oversees uh, public, uh, public banks uh, and oversees other types of institutions like, uh, like the lottery, lottery and, and things like that. So there are a lot of, of, of sort of bits and pieces. But what I would think it's, it's the most important for anyone who wants the job uh, is that um, it's not just that you're doing the budget and you're setting up what the taxes should be or that, uh, that you set up what the expenditure limit should be and you're basically uh, arguing with every minister who obviously wants to, to spend more. It's the fact that everyone's problem is, becomes your problem really fast. There isn't a problem in the government that does not get to the Ministry of Finance and to the Ministry of Justice. So whatever happens, whether it's like the national television or if there is a problem with the culture or with the energy, with the energy subsidies, with the whatever it is, it's going to become your problem. So, so I think the challenge for the, the Ministry of Finance um, is, yeah, it's on one side, yes, doing the budget, being the tough guy, girl in the room, saying no to all the expenditures, it's part, it's part of the, the job description, but uh, it's, it's this part where you need to understand how everything works because it's going to become your problem. So to some extent you need to understand a little bit of what it means to give some energy subsidies. You, you need to understand uh, how, uh, how certain environmental protection things work. You need to understand many, many other things because when they come to you, you need to make a decision about that. So you don't need to be an expert in all of them, but you need to understand uh, every part. And I think there is another um, aspect to it, if you want the job, uh, is um, you need to, um, I think engineers call it thinking systems. I think it's very helpful. I don't think you can afford in a Ministry of Finance to think just like little, today we're gonna think only about this little, little piece. This, this piece of, well, of legislation deals with, I don't know, we're giving some money to vulnerable consumers uh, who are hit by the energy prices. And we're not thinking about anything else. We're just thinking about that. It's impossible. If you do that, you're gonna do a terrible job. So your job is to think in systems. Your job is to understand how that subsidy would, 
flow in, in all the other direction and affect everything else because in the end it's going to hit you back. It's going to hit you back because it affects indirectly, I don't know what other tax revenue in another part. It can affect you because it might affect tax evade, uh, uh, evasion in, in, in another area. It might affect, I don't know, employment somehow and then you end up paying much more uh, benefits on the employment side. So I think that's what makes it really, really complicated is because you're not just doing, as you might be expecting, just setting up taxes or setting up benefit. It's just basically solving everyone's problem. And in general, I think if you want to be popular, you don't want to become finance minister because you really, really have to be always the adult in the room. And most of the time, the adult in the room says no to a lot of things. So. Usually, if you are a finance minister who says yes to everything, then that's not going to end up very well. You have to say yes just to some things. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Uh, we're short on time. I'm really hoping this last question is a yes-no question, but you know, uh, go right yes. ahead. Uh, it's not a yes-no question, but I'll try to keep it simple. I, I'm really, uh, first of all, thank you so much. This has been really amazing for me to hear all these perspectives. Uh, probably learned a lot in last one hour than probably in 10 years. <laughs> so <laughs> for me, it's really, uh, what I, I uh, my name is Mac Karlika, I run a digital agency, and my very simple question is, given the amount of experience you all have, you know, the, uh, the knowledge and you have seen the ups and down in the market, if you have to define a technology-led solution, whether it's an AI or a data science, where it complements the human experience, what will that solution be, which will not only predict where the crisis may happen, but also provide recommendations to prevent it. And of course, you know it's already happening around the world. I'm really curious to see here your views. Uh, I'm really sorry, it's not a yes, no question, but leave, leave it up to you to answer or not. Anybody have a burning desire to tackle this? I do, I do. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I've been talking all morning about AI, so I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, I, think, um, I think AI is it's just a wonderful opportunity if you but smart in a very smart way. So, um, so here is something that where I think AI might be helpful if again it's done with 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 a lot of care. Um, so um, there are um, academic papers done by math people um, that actually are able to predict. Of voters' um, opinion and, and, and preferences based on initial surveys, right? So I think it's very important that we have elections every four years, and uh, and and that's the bedrock of, of the democracy. But the problem for policymakers and politicians is that in those four years in which they are in office, they might do or not do what their voters actually want them to do. The voters that put them in office, I'm not talking random voters, random uh, um, uh, stakeholders. Um, and I think it would be really interesting if, if based on, on, on just some initial data on those voters, we will be able to predict how they would react to certain policies and use that to have policies that would be in line with those voters. Because I feel that would be um, adding to the democracy, not subtracting. So I'm not taking away from people's vote. That should stay. That should stay the way it is. It's very important that people vote every year and express their, their opinions and, 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 and keep politicians uh, responsible. But you can use this technology for good in order to make it even more democratic what you do in office. I am actually somehow surprised that this has not been done so far because um, the technology to some extent is there. And the technology has been used in evil ways so far. So that's why I started by saying I think it could be a wonderful thing if we're doing it in a responsible and, and smart way. Because if we're thinking to the Cambridge Analytica um, um, debacle, where they use the data to predict basically uh, how you feel about certain topic and use that data to basically manipulate you. That's the most evil thing you can do with that data and with the technology and, and what you have. And, and, and so obviously they used it for that, but no one thought it, how about we should use it to, I don't know, provide better services that would actually be in line with what these people actually want. Because you can use the same data to do that. So I think that would be very helpful. But for that, I think we need to be super careful 
and super responsible about AI and sort of have very good regulations on how this is used, such that this wonderful technology would be used to advance democracy and not kill it, because you can really go in either direction. Um, so um, so that's, that's an example. I think I can give you more, but I see that. And I think Vicky so wanted to good. jump in well, on this. Um, only because of what, what you've been saying, Ioana, yeah. uh, which is, uh, you know, how do you make sure it doesn't end up all being bad? Um, as one does at night, you know, you read your pa the paper you haven't read, you know, you go to bed and you pick it up and you read. And then uh, I saw this just a few days ago that I think UCL may have been involved, but um, I think there were uh, scientists and from and computer scientists from Cambridge or Oxford who went to present it to the select committee. I think it must have been DCMS in, in government uh, on AI. And their conclusion was that AI was very likely to completely annihilate mankind. Uh, and I was just reading this and I'm thinking, what? You know, perhaps I'll still live to tomorrow, thinking about whether you live before, before there's a change of, of reserve currency. Um, and, and then it concluded by saying, well, the, the optimistic thing was we managed not to kill ourselves completely or eliminate mankind with nuclear weapons so far. So maybe there's some hope uh, that we'll do the same with AI. But their conclusions were incredibly negative. Uh, so regulation, yeah. but doing something, I mean, obviously there are wonderful things you can do, uh, amazing things to improve productivity if you do this right, uh, and a lot more transparency and everything else, but it can also be completely the opposite. So I couldn't agree more <laughs> with what Vicky said. I wrote a piece for The Hill a few weeks back about this. Um, and I think what, what Vicky is talking about is what's called AGI. So sort of more like, let's think about this sort of a super intelligence, so not necessarily the, the little chat GPT type of thing that we're used to. And um, it, it can be a serious concern. And the reason I think we should be advocating for regulation, I think it's one that has to do with expected values. Anyone statistics here? Okay, so, so here is my, my statistical point to why we should worry about AGI, because while it might be a small probability, I don't know, let's assume it's a tiny probability that, that we create the super intelligence that really kills us all. It's a small one, but we can all agree that actually the outcome is pretty negative. It's really big. So when you do the expected value of this, it still comes out something really, really big. So because of that alone, I think we should act and we should have regulation. And I think, um, think through this, if you think we're exaggerating, we can I. Um, I only read the report. You only read, okay, so, so uh, if you think I, I exaggerate, but um, uh, think about this. So uh, a few weeks back, NASA sent, uh, NASA sent a, a, a rocket to divert an asteroid uh, just as to practice. There was not any danger to us. Um, the probability that we're going to hit by one is like really, really small. But obviously, they made an effort to, to, to learn how to do this, to be prepared in the small possibility that something really disastrous might happen. So I think. Keeping the analogy, if something completely disastrous could happen with AGI, then we should do something about it because it's really important. And I think okay. the sign was like, I should kind of, okay. So, no, now everybody, now everybody yeah, wants yeah. to talk. <laughs> well, I mean, Final comment. AI, AI isn't going to, uh, to, to, to yeah, it's, I, I'm so old, it's certainly not going to catch me, I think. But... Uh, we seem to be doing a good enough job of destroying the world anyway without the AI, <laughs> and we're not solving that. And uh, if, you, if you look at climate change as the, 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 the biggest thing in the room, very well understood, et cetera, et cetera, everyone agrees we should be doing something about it. We're not doing anything about it, or not much. Uh, it's getting worse. You know, who needs AI? <laughs> and on that gloriously optimistic note under which expectation the dollar will outlast us all as a reserve currency um, that's a little bit more than we have time for uh, before we thank our speakers can I remind you about our next policy and practice event which is a little bit um, postponed due to strike action as well as our usual uh, reading week break um, our next event will be on the 9th of March it's on the topic of China's involvement in Africa um, and you can sign up for that via our website and via Eventbrite, um, as you will have done for this one. 
Um, if you don't already, please follow us uh, on Twitter and Instagram. The handle is UCLSPP. That will keep you updated with the events that we run like this one and also the re research that's coming out of the, the political science department as well. And uh, now, uh, please join us for drinks uh, over in Gordon Square. If you don't know where that is, uh, follow someone who's up at the front here. They'll know where they're going and can, can lead you over there. Um, thank you all very much for joining us and please join me in a round of applause to thank our speakers. Thank you.